Hello, I'm Adrian Kennard, I'm from Andrews and Arnold, and once again I find we're having to explain a little bit about encryption to politicians. And I know it's a complicated subject, so I'm going to try and explain something in as simple way as I can. The sort of thing we hear is that there should be no way for terrorists to safely communicate, no place to hide. And once again we hear this, and it's a, worth thinking about the phrase a little bit, so I'll try and explain. So first off, let's say... Um, well, which of the terrorists? If we're saying there's no safe way for terrorists to communicate, are we saying that, in fact, there needs to be a safe way for normal people, non-terrorists, to communicate, but no way for terrorists to communicate? We, we are, after all, saying it's only terrorists that we're worried about, not normal people. So, um, to do that, you have to be able to tell us apart. So how would you do this? And um, when you've identified those terrorists, how do you make sure that they're, they're no longer going to use the communications reserved for the non-terrorists? Um, do you give them some sort of notice that they've been summarily deemed to be terrorists and denied access to all secure communications? How would you do that? Um, would access to secure communications have to have a license or something and, and you'd revoke it if anyone's a suspect? Now, obviously, such a process couldn't have the normal due process to prove they've committed a crime or something like this, you'd have to be able to do it purely on suspicion, because if you could prove they've committed a crime, you could lock them up and stop them communicating that way, or stop them doing whatever they were planning to do. So you have to be able to do this purely on the basis of suspicion. You have to be able to revoke someone's licence to use safe communication based purely on suspicion, or a report from a neighbour, or something like that. It's not a nice society to live in. Um, but then, you know, assuming you're not going to go based purely on a comment by a neighbour, how would you know they're terrorists? Well, one way to tell, presumably, is by what they're communicating. Is what they're communicating something that looks like planning some sort of attack? Well, the problem there is if they're currently using the safe communication reserved for the non-terrorists, you can't tell what they're saying. You can only tell what they're saying if it's not safe and you can listen in on the communications. So that's only really going to make sense if what you're saying in the first place is actually not that there's no safe place for terrorists to communicate, but there's no safe place for people to communicate. You can't really have it that any people can communicate securely at all if you're going to be able to look at the communications to work out whether they're terrorists or not. And, and if that's what politicians are trying to say, are they trying to say there should be no safe way for people to communicate, then they should say that, and we can see how popular that is. I think it will be less popular than using the word terrorists because they're not, they, they've got no practical way to limit the restricted communications just to the terrorists. Of course, you could have some sort of uh, system where only approved people uh, get a license to use secure communications, some sort of uh, basis on positive vetting or something. Only the elite people get to, to actually use secure communications. Only the elite people actually get to use credit cards on websites and buy things. Um, perhaps that's what the politicians are saying, but again, if that's what they mean, say so. Don't pretend you're trying to block only terrorists communicating safely, because that doesn't make sense. The other thing you have to think about, if you're thinking about safe and unsafe communications, is who can see the communication. Now, the problem is that with proper end-to-end -end encryption, the only people who can see the communication are the intended recipient. So if you're having unsafe communications, you're saying that someone in the middle can see that communication. But who? And of course the answer is the good people. Um, now I'm sure politicians will go into a lot of bother to explain who these good people are. They are of course people with the appropriate legal authority, with the necessary checks and balances and warrants and accountability, uh, where, there's, where there's reasonable suspicion and all of this, and perhaps even when they've gone to a judge to to demonstrate that all. But at the end of the day, all we're saying is it's good people only must be able to see this and not the bad people. Now you can ignore the technical issues just for a moment and think, who are the good people? So um, if a UK newspaper editor is sending a WhatsApp message to uh, a journalist in Korea, presumably the Korean government will consider that they are good people and require WhatsApp to give them a copy of that message because they're, they're in charge there. Uh, just the same as in the UK, on the UK end, we'll, we'll expect the UK government to be able to get a copy of that message. Who, who is a good person who's entitled to see the message depends on your viewpoint. And we're talking international communications here. So we might not all agree on 
who is good and who is bad. If we then do even vaguely consider the technical issues, we know time and time again, if there is any sort of what's called backdoor, then that will allow the good people access, but it will also allow the bad people. They will definitely exploit that. Now, it doesn't matter how much technology you put in the way, you can bribe someone at the intermediate company with enough money and they will get the messages for you. You can hack computers and that will get the messages. There are so many ways that bad people can access it. And the only real protection against bad people accessing things is to actually make the messaging secure in the first place. That is the big battle that the internet companies have. We are fighting criminals every day, not just the occasional terrorist. We're fighting people trying to hack into computers all the time. And the way we do this is to improve security and make encryption unbreakable and not exposed in the middle of the communication. That's an important step, end-to-end -end encryption. Without consider, let's suppose you get these laws in place and it all makes sense. Um, will the criminals take notice of the law? Well, you could even ban encryption completely. You could say, no encryption is allowed. We're watching every message. We've got computers looking for things that look like they might be encrypted and we'll jump on you straight away if we see it. Problem there is criminals can encrypt things. They can use a pen and paper to encrypt things, or if they're even slightly more sophisticated, the computer systems, the software to do really good computer encryption is readily available. So that's possible. But even on pen and paper, you can do encryption that nobody can crack. The NSA and GCHQ can't crack. This is possible with no more technology than pen, paper and dice. So they can encrypt things and there are ways of hiding the encryption. You know, I'm not going to try and explain the details. I'll come up with a really simple one. You end up encrypting something and it comes out as a random string of letters. So you write, you write a letter where the first letter of each line is, is the letter that's encrypted and the rest is just a story you've made up to fit those letters. You've possibly seen people do this before. There's probably a word for it. But there are actually sophisticated computer techniques to hide something in an image or a video where you cannot ever tell. Even mathematically, there's no way to prove that there's an encrypted message in there, but there is. So even if you ban encryption, you can't tell the criminals use encryption. So if you succeed in this, you actually make it so that normal non-terrorists can't communicate safely, can't buy things on the internet because they won't be able to put their credit card number in without fear of it being disclosed. In fact, the merchants won't be able to sell to the UK because the merchant systems don't allow them to sell where the communication isn't encrypted. So if the government get their way and want a backdoor in communications between my browser and some foreign website, that website won't be allowed to operate credit cards to UK customers. And so, so that's, the, that's the downside. Of course, there's no downside for the criminals. They just move to using encryption systems that they've made themselves, or at worst, pen and paper. But they can still communicate secretly and covertly. They still have a safe place to communicate because, well, at the end of the day, mathematics still exists. And they're not going to take notice of any law that tells them not to. So we have politicians that do not understand these most basic of facts and are calling for no safe place for people to communicate when all they will do is actually just give terrorists and bad guys the edge. We need to, we need to educate politicians. We need to make them understand the challenges that they face and understand that this is a battle they won't win. So they need to concentrate their efforts on other ways to catch criminals. I hope that's helpful.